in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, this today's webinar uh, hosted by the NOAA National Marine Protected Area Center. Um, I'm Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network and I'm standing in for Lauren Wenzel today. Uh, she regrets that she's not able to be here today to host the webinar. Um, and this webinar is co-hosted by my organization, the EBM Tools Network, which is uh, co-sponsored by NatureServe and uh, OpenChannels.org. And we have a representative from OpenChannels.org with us today, Nick Weiner, who is, uh, is, is also helping to moderate the webinar. And this webinar is also co-sponsored by um, the MPA News. Okay, so welcome to our presenters today. Um, we have Matthew Chassie and Robert Toonin. Uh, Matt is with NOAA and Robert uh, is with the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, we're, they're going to be presenting to, uh, today about the new Heia National Estuary and Research Reserve. Uh, to let you know a little bit more about our presenters, uh, Matt Chassie is a coastal management specialist with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Uh, he has supported the National Estuary and Research Reserve System t since 2004 and works collaboratively with a variety of federal, state, and local stakeholders in support of the five Gulf of Mexico reserves. Matt has been part of the NOAA team supporting the designation of the last three reserves that have joined the national system. He is actively engaged in convening and collaborating with stakeholders to achieve coastal resilience and habitat restoration objectives at multiple geographic scales. He's a master's in environmental science and policy from John Hopkins University. Uh, Rob Toonin is a research professor in the School of Ocean and Earth Sciences and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and is lo located at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Bio Biology in Kaneohe Bay on the island of Oahu. Uh, his research interests span a broad range of topics concerning the evolution and ecology of trophic marine biodiversity with the aim of applying his findings to conservation and management efforts. To date, he and his students have published over 200 peer-reviewed papers. Some current projects include coral reef biodiversity, population connectivity for fisheries management, alien invasive species biology, and coral resilience under human impacts and future climate change. Together with Heia's site partners, he has been involved with the efforts to nominate and designate the Heia NIRS uh, from the early stages of the process. And before we get started, the last thing I wanted to let you know is how to ask questions. Uh, we will have a designated question and answer period at the end of the webinar, but you can go ahead and send in questions uh, throughout the webinar uh, by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. So. Uh, if it's a short clarifying question, we may be able to uh, get uh, Matt and Rob to answer it during the during the presentation, but we'll save most of the questions till the end. Uh, but again, please feel free to send in questions at any uh, uh, at any point during the webinar by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. Okay, uh, Matt and Rob, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sarah. This is Matt Chassie with NOAA, and I want to, before we get into actually the details of the designation of the HEA near and the site specifically, I want to go into some context about what a National Estuary Research Reserve is and what our system is. So we are a network of 29 estuarine sites around the country used to study coastal wetlands and to educate the public about estuarine systems. Reserves are lands and waters that are protected for long-term research and education and coastal stewardship. The lands are typically owned and managed by the states and their partners. Using existing state protections, this is important to note that NOAA does not really impose any additional regulations on these lands and waters. And it's really important to note that uh, reserves are locally relevant but nationally significant. What a reserve is not, uh, there is no, you know, direct federal management, day-to-day -day management of these sites. It's not a sanctuary or refuge. Uh, it relies on existing land management regulations and policies of the area and does not ban any existing uses or activities. So you, the NEARS are a unique state federal partnership program. Now, there's not many of these types of programs in the federal government, but uh, NOAA provides national coordination technical assistance and funding, 
And each reserve is managed by a lead state partner. In this case, it will be university, but there are also state agencies as well, with input from other site partners and local stakeholders. Uh, both the, the federal and state partners are financially invested in a reserve through a mandated 70 to 30 cost share arrangement for annual operating budgets. So what do reserves actually do? And this kind of will lead into uh, our discussion about the new HEI and NEAR. They conduct environmental monitoring of research on these estuary site, estuarine sites uh, to address local issues and are considered essentially living laboratories. They provide professional training for local decision makers to improve coastal management. They offer K through 12 and public education programming to students and adults. And they are also stewards of the natural resources at these sites to ensure long-term protection for the activities I previously stated. And how might they accomplish these things? They, um, these activities are coordinated nationally but implemented locally. Being a place-based uh, reserve, uh, the staff engage local communities and create strong local partnerships. They are able to successfully integrate research, education, stewardship capacities to achieve reserve management objectives. And this model uh, for providing a comprehensive and integrated approach uh, to management uh, is critical for these estuarine systems. So some of the programs that uh, or parts of the NEARS that bind our system together uh, are as follows. So we have a swamp system, which is the system-wide monitoring program, where we monitor a range of water quality, weather, and biological parameters to detect short-term variations and long-term trends that then can be used to address coastal management issues. We have a coastal training program that provides up-to-date science information and skill trainings to allow for better informed decision making by local and regional coastal decision makers to improve coastal management. We have a K through 12 education program, affectionately known as KEEP, to increase ocean literacy for students, teachers, and the general public. We have a near Sentinel site program, which is different from NOAA's uh, Sentinel sites, but they are part and parcel of the same. Um, they are integrated characterization of water levels and marsh elevations on a common vertical scale so that we can look at habitat response to long-term changes in water levels and inundation patterns at these sites. And we also have a, a national uh, science collaborative competitive funding program to support user-driven collaborative research assessment and transfer activities that address critical coastal management needs that have been identified by our sites. So getting back to the HEIA National Estuarine Research Reserve, um, there is a process for designating a reserve to a national system. And this, is, uh, this graphic shows that process in course detail. So I'm going to briefly describe this process that, that Hawaii went through to get a reserve designated. And there are key parts of this process I wanted to point out. One is there's a letter of interest that needs to be received from the governor of the state having the reserve. NOAA does not initiate this process. It's really initiated by the state. And there's also a detailed site selection process led by the state that results in a nomination of a site to NOAA. Upon NOAA's approval of such a nomination, there are several more steps that need to happen. One is the there's the development of a site management plan that is led by the state. And there's the development of an environmental impact statement led by NOAA as, this is, as per the National Environmental Policy Act since a designation is technically a federal action. There's also the development of an MOA or Memorandum of Understanding or Agreement between NOAA and the state partner. And equal, equally important, especially for universities, is the development of an MOA between the state and all the land-owning partners or key stakeholders, since most universities do not own the lands in which uh, the reserves are based. And eventually, there's a designation findings and a record of decision by NOAA. 
that will make uh, it official. And then the, basically the no administrator designates a new reserve to the system. Needless to say, this process takes some time. And on average, it's about five years once a governor's letter of intent is received to actually designate a reserve. So a little bit of historical context, context for Hawaii. Uh, they did have a reserve at one point. Waimata Valley was designated in 1978 and was de-designated in 1993 upon mutual agreement by the state and NOAA at the time. And there were issues that led to this de-designation, which was related to access, land use, and limited resource funding resources at the time. Now this go around, the Hawaii is definitely working to avoid those, those problems they had with the last site. So how did they get the site designated? Well, Governor Abercrombie submitted a letter of interest to NOAA in July 2012, proposing the addition of a new reserve in Hawaii. In his letter, the governor identified the Hawaii Office of Planning to manage the designation process for the state but they, he identified the university as potentially the partner to operate the reserve. And then in 2013, the state used a public solicitation process to send out calls for proposals for a future reserve site. So there were different sites that were looked at. The, the state received interest in submitting a proposal from 10 proponents looking at different sites around the islands. From these formal proposals received for two, which are checked here, Kilo Bay and the Hii Estuary and Kaneohe Bay. So once those uh, two uh, proposals were received, the state formed a, a selection, and about a selection evaluation, and a site selection committee to review these proposals and recommend a site for nomination. As part of the process, the state also solicited public input on these two sites that were being proposed. The state developed site selection criteria based on a uh, template NOAA provides. And those criteria fall under four major categories I'll just briefly say something about. Environmental representativeness, which looks at the suite of ecological, biological, physical, and chemical characteristics of a site the value of the site for research, monitoring, and resource protection, its suitability as a site for education, interpretation, and future acquisition and management considerations. Uh, subsequently, the site evaluation committee apply, uh, applied these criteria to these sites and found both to be good candidate sites. As a result, they were both forwarded to the site selection committee, who then selected the HEES site, and that recommendation was forwarded to the governor for nomination. As a result, not, the state of Hawaii developed a site nomination document uh, for the HEES to raise a near site, and as part of that, there were public meetings that were held in early 2014 to solicit community feedback, engage kind of support or opposition for the no site nomination. And after these meetings and changes to the documents, uh, a nomination was submitted to NOAA with this public input. So NOAA accepted the nomination and began the next phase of the designation process. Concurrently, NOAA led a NEPA process, as I mentioned before, resulting in a draft and final environmental impact statement. And as part of that, there was scoping to help inform the development of that environmental impact statement. And the state led a management planning process, resulted in a draft and final management plan. And so the state organized uh, focus groups uh, and brought in interested parties to uh, address topics like research and monitoring, training, education, resource, resource management, and public outreach. And each of these groups was met and uh, was used to develop uh, goals and objectives relevant to those topics for the future site. And a steering committee was also met to kind of provide input to the focus groups and give a management perspective. And so there was a lot of engagement with the public that uh, 
preceded uh, actual designation as part of these processes. So this was not the state or NOAA acting in a vacuum. And both, both parties, NOAA and the state, supported each other during this process. The result was a five-year management plan and a complete environmental analysis of designation. And as part of that analysis, the actual preferred site or what was designated was actually a little bit larger than a nominated site. And that uh, site became designated as the 29th reserve in our system on January 19th of this year. OK, enough of the process piece. Where is this site? Well, it's on the island of Oahu in Kaneohe Bay. So that's where that orange arrow points to. More specifically, when we look closely, it's 1,385 acres of lands and waters in Kaneohe Bay. And there are, main there are several main habitat components of that and features. So in the marine areas, there are over 800 acres of, I guess, primarily patch and fringing coral reefs and sand flats, and the most pristine reefs in the bay, which are around the small island, uh, Coconut Island, in the, in the right corner. And that island itself is 20 acres, and that's home to the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, where Rob works. And UH has a research lab there and the reserve managing partner. And it's surrounded by actually the most protected parts of the bay, the Hawaii Marine Laboratory Refuge. There's also, you notice, there's a fish pond. 80 acres of fish pond is historically and culturally significant to Native Hawaiians. And it, the fish pond dates back to at least 1480 is on the National Register of Historic Places. The pond wall extends 7,000 feet and was commonly used historically for cultural and harvest of mullet and milkfish for consumption by Native peoples. And then there are the remaining lands and our uplands, and that's around 400 acres, consisting of estuarine and freshwater wetlands, forested uplands, and 19 acres of Heia State Park. Uh, this mix of public and private lands is also where uh, demonstration loi or taro fields are found and the Heia stream which flows through the middle of the site. And I will point out that um, the fish pond itself is actually owned by Kamehameha Schools and is currently being restored and operated by Papa Oia, which is a local nonprofit group. And this kind of talks a little bit about more about the ownership mosaic of the site. And obviously, with the university partner, as I previously mentioned, they don't own most of this land and waters. Uh, that's the critic that demonstrates the critical need for a multi-party MOA between uh, UH and those other partners. And it's kind of one of the main differences between a university versus state agency-led reserve. And within the uplands, it's important to note that the uplands, or most of them, are, are owned by the Hawaiian Community Development Authority and is leased to Kaka'oyibi, which is a community-based nonprofit trying to restore the agricultural and ecological productivity of the wetlands of Aiea, which is these are the taro fields that I mentioned just a minute ago. And the rest of the, the waters are mostly they're owned by the state. Here's an oblique aerial view of the site to give you a little more perspective. In the lower part, you see the fish pond, and then you see the, the Hia wetlands and uplands um, in the upper part of the watershed there. So why this site? Why Hia? Well, it's uh, part of the insular biogeographic region of the Pacific Islands, which was unrepresented in our system. Given the extent of the alterations of the system and the problem with invasive species, there's huge opportunities to restore native habitats. And with the ongoing work of the site partners, 
the reserve has a unique opportunity to research and monitor the implementation of traditional cultural and ecological practices at this site. The reserve is going to provide opportunities to explore a unique research question, which relates to looking at the traditional cultural and ecological practices uh, that predate Western influences and also looking at more modern ecological restoration. Okay, what other benefits of a reserve in AEA are important to note? I'll say that Kaneohe Bay is the largest embayment in Hawaii. It's the only site in the United States with uh, fringing, patch, and barrier reef. Uh, DLNR, which is the state land, natural, Department of Land and Natural Resources, has identified the area as a sustainability hotspot. There is a NOAA Sentinel site located in Kaneohe Bay, and the HIMB research facilities are already there, present, uh, conducting a wide range of research. And it's also one of the most studied coral reef ecosystems on the planet, based on the research that HIMB and others have done. So I want to get to the one of the main uh, benefits, I think, of having this reserve here is looking at what their research question is going to be. And so they're going to look to examine ecosystem services provided under the two fundamental management strategies that I've previously noted. And given the scale of the research, restoration and manipulation ongoing at this site, this is a very important factor for the site specifically. Uh, one of these strategies is the contemporary ecological restoration techniques is more modern, more Western derived. And then the other is looking at traditional Native Hawaiian management practices that were realized under the Aupua system prior to Western influence. And so how's the reserve going to address this using this integrative approach that the reserves commonly do around the country? And we're hoping that the Hainer will be a model for ecosystem-based management strategies for Pacific Islands ecosystems in a broad scale. So this is what the site used to look like historically. I believe this is a photo from the 1920s, but it shows the extensive agricultural practices that were taking place within the site. More recently, you can see this comparison of then and now. You see the historical on the left and the more recent photo on the, on the right. And you'll see on the left, large functioning taro fields. The fish pond was intact. Minimal development around the site. Fast forward to present day. The eastern side of the site is mostly developed. The wetlands have been kind of overtaken by invasive species. And the fish pond was in the state of disrepair. That has since been uh, fixed, so they, they are making progress on that end. As described in the reserve management plan, some of the management strategies that uh, were identified include the redevelopment and restoration of traditional Hawaiian agricultural practices. Uh, and that is actually shown as the taro loi, and it's in light green. Uh, the fish pond is in light blue, and you'll notice, you know, there's these white lines in the light green, and those are, those are historic agricultural roads that are going to be restored to support the uh, lowy agricultural practices. And then there are a host of other smaller activities uh, that they're going to attempt on the site. And so this is what a restored taro lowy looks like. and this provides an experimental opportunity, I think, to explore the land use impacts of this, these traditional practices on the estuarine and coral reef environments downstream. Uh, the site partner, Kako Ivi, has observed that even in, uh, now, endangered Hawaiians still are using these restored uh, lowy areas. 
looking more on the the more I, I would say modern ecological restoration side of things. There's plenty of habitat opportunities to restore habitats that the reserve is going to attempt over the over the next year, few years or more. One is looking at the restoration of native forests in light yellow. So they're going to reintroduce native forest species to those areas. Um, in the light green on land, they're going to uh, restore native wetland species, replacing the invasive mangroves in the estuarine areas. And in darker blue, there's, they're going to restore the Hiya stream hydrology and riparian areas with native species as well. In the marine areas, you'll see the light blue. That's all going to be coral reef restoration. Some of it's ongoing as we speak. And primarily, that's looking at the removal of invasive algae species and adding native sea urchins to control uh, remaining algae. And to show you an example of how that looks, um, on the left, they use something called a super sucker to remove the invasive algae from the reefs. And then they outplant native uh, sea urchins to control remaining algae population. And now I'm going to uh, hand it off to Dr. Rob Tunin from the University of Hawaii to kind of talk about the partnerships and how the reserve plans to make all this happen. Rob? Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so our reserve is all about trying to work uh, with the cooperative partners. And uh, if you can go on to the next slide, please, Matt. This is a slide from the other perspective that Matt showed earlier on with the oblique view that he showed of the fish pond and the wetlands. This is looking from uh, Mokualoi or, or Coconut Island, looking back upstream uh, to the mountain reserve where the stream waters of Heia stream flow through that uh, proposed uh, Loi restoration area where there will be extensive work by uh, Kakoi Ivi to try to add uh, a more natural meandering stream uh, that has now been filled in with alien invasive uh, species in terms of the grasslands have, have taken over the entire wetland, uh, introduced mangroves, uh, which are alien in, invasive species here in Hawaii, <coughs> have been uh, choking out the stream mouth and changing the hydrology of the area quite con quite uh, considerably. And so we'll be looking at the pattern of this coming down the watershed from the mountains to this research lab that has been here since before the 1950s, uh, actively studying the uh, nearshore waters of Kaneohe Bay and looking at what effect does this large-scale restoration activity restoring both native species and uh, traditional Native Hawaiian management practices play on the health and uh, productivity of nearshore coral reef ecosystems as, as the receiving end of that traditional watershed. And on to the next slide, please, Matt. So there are a great number of site partners here, and, and this site is really unique in terms of it being driven from the community side. And so these are some of our, our site partners, starting with uh, the Ko'olaupoko Hawaiian Civic Club, Kakoi Iwi, Paipai Ohe'ia. Um, further upstream, there are other groups that are not part of our site, but who are also actively involved in Native uh, Hawaiian restoration and, and traditional uh, removing alien invasive species and replanting uh, native species in those locations, Papahana uh, Kuaola. And so these partners have been actually uh, working on this. this. This effort came out of a community effort that started in the 1990s that proposed uh, with the formalization of the Kaneohe Bay Master Plan an effort to consider trying to get this area designated as a NEARS. And so the community has actually had this in mind and been working towards this goal for quite some time before asking uh, the University of Hawaii and, and in particular the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to join in on that effort and to help lead as the state partner on the NEARS designation. 
And so all of these site partners have been actively trying to restore their areas for some time. And we have the advantage and the benefit that, as Matt said, if we look at the before and after photographs with this huge urban area now in the, the upper part of the map where the city of Kaneohe is now built, this area historically had about the same population as it does today. And by many estimates, for 800 years prior to Western contact, it supported essentially the same population as today is living in that city, but they were living entirely off the land. They were living in a sustainable uh, aquaculture and, and harvesting society where they were unable to bring in food from Safeway. They didn't have any uh, external input of food where today the estimates are we probably have about 72 hours of, of food if we were cut off from the mainland. And this is a very stark contrast between how the, the management and community interacted with the land then and now. And we have this incredible benefit with the next slide, please, Matt, of in Hawaii, um, are you, I don't see the slide advancing. Did it advance, Matt? Sorry, it did not. I don't. So in Hawaii, we have this uh, incredible group of uh, knowledge holders, the kupuna, are the people in the community who, there we go, um, who have lineal ties to this place and family have lived in this area and basically passed on knowledge of how management strategies occurred in this place for 800 years. And so we actually have people whose the, the knowledge of the management strategy is basically providing us that guidance to compare, as Matt said, different management strategies for this place. And so the ultimate research question that everyone is very interested in is what is the best management strategy <coughs> for a tropical estuarine site like Heia? And we can learn from the past, we can learn from people who had managed successfully a population of roughly equivalent size to today and try to compare that side by side with some of the modern management strategies and ask the question, can we develop a management strategy that provides us with the full suite of ecosystem services in a more sustainable way that will last and provide guidance into the future. And on to the next slide. Um, that was basically the question, the, the information that we wanted to pass along and I think with that we'll open it up for some questions. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, let's see. So I just wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can you ask questions by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. Uh, we just have one question so far, but um, hopefully a bunch more will come in. Um, so let's see. How is sediment runoff controlled from the tarot fields? So Bob, why don't you handle that one? Okay. So the tarot fields, basically what the idea is is that there's both uh, the stream itself right now does not flow through its historical channel and so it's a much more direct path there are, are basically there was agricultural irrigation ditches that have been dug into the area and so the effort is to try to restore the stream into its its historical pathway and to allow a natural buffer for more meandering. There's also plans to what is now uh, basically a channelized output uh, towards the stream mouth is to put in a retention pond there, a, a small uh, freshwater fish pond upstream of, of the fish pond. And what we have seen in the last couple of storms as people um, primarily uh, TNC and Kim Falinski's research has been looking at sediments in the taro fields. What we find is that during base uh, low water flow conditions, those 
taro fields tend to be a net exporter of small amounts of sediments, but during large uh, storm events where we have huge pulses of sediment coming down with uh, large storm events, they tend to retain a great deal of sediment as the stream rises up, floods into the taro fields and acts as an enormous settling pond with the taro basically capturing a lot of those sediments during the uh, storm events themselves. And so the question is trying to figure out what are the benefits in terms of the timing and pulsing of sediments, how much sediment is moving, and then comparing with that the nutrient export of all of those plants that are growing in the area and pulling out nutrients from that freshwater input, and then also looking at uh, the use of the area by native species. So as Matt said, birds that have historically not been seen in the area, both the endangered coot uh, and the uh, 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 stilts, thank you, are, are now uh, showing up in this area and are starting to nest here. There have been seven fledgings of the endangered Hawaiian stilt that was not seen prior to this restoration effort. And so what we see is native species coming back and using these areas in ways that we have not seen when the area is filled in with the alien invasive species. And so we have to consider the full range of ecosystem services and not count on any one particular aspect as what is the, the total benefit of the site. Okay. Great, thank you guys. All right, let's see, we have several more questions. Um, do you have a long-term plan for adapting to sea level rise and other climate change impacts? Yes, we do. Uh, so one of the, uh, well, there are two answers to that. One answer is that different groups have been doing different things. One of the uh, things that we've seen here recently is that we've had what are called king tides. Uh, we often have, it, at this time of year, it's normal for us to have extreme highs and lows, but this year the tide, the high tide mark was about a foot of above the long-term average or, or what was predicted, and so there were already many areas that were underwater. The fish pond made news that the entire fish pond wall was underwater for the first time in anyone's memory. Uh, and this is something that is expected and predicted to happen much more commonly. And the fish pond has already made a plan and reached out to the community for uh, building up the height of the seawall. And so there's, there are now plans to add uh, material to the, the upper layer of the, sea, of the fish pond wall and, and to build that up. Freshwater fish ponds upstream of that may become inundated and would also become estuarine and could be managed and used in the same way as the uh, fish pond that is now under management by Pai Pai uh, And one of the statewide uh, management strategies for climate change, there was a large study that was conducted for the state of Hawaii looking at what we could do as a state for climate change preparedness. And one of the calls that they had was to examine and reinstate many of the traditional Native Hawaiian practices that dealt with a variety of different climatic conditions over the last 800 years. And that that is actually what is the primary goal of this site is looking at how do we uh, reinstate those practices and how do they enable us to be more resilient to a changing climate. Okay, great, thank you. Great question and great response. Um, let's see, another question. Can you touch upon the partnership between Pay Pay and NIRS and elaborate uh, how the NIRS will navigate working with a local managing group? Well, Bob, that's for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so all of these groups have actually, so Pai Ohe'ia has been actively restoring the fish pond for you know, at least the 15 years that I have known and worked with them. And so those groups will continue to do those uh, the same efforts that they have done. 
what the NEARS now provides is the opportunity for HIMB and PiPi and Kakoo to, instead of, of each doing their own uh, restoration efforts, sort of in isolation and, and keeping one another abreast of what we are doing, is to have a single coordinated effort that we can all basically um, build upon for this entire site to be restored to a traditional Ahokua'a management strategy. And it's, it's virtually impossible for any small group with control of one area to do that because we're talking about an entire watershed. And the NEARS is the glue that will hold together all of these different community efforts and then allow the community vision of the watershed to be restored and to evaluate the change in the management strategy um, to what that means for nearshore fisheries, coral reefs, and, and productivity. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see. Will the typical NEARS coordinator positions be filled, uh, and what is the timeline and process for that, and what will the relationship be between the NEARS staff and other partners? Well, I would, this is Matt. I would, I would say that at least uh, when it comes to timing, the reserve will probably be looking to hire sometime in the fall or later for some of those positions. But the typical positions you find in the NEARS will, will, will be in place at some point in the future with the new reserve. And Rob, I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Yeah, so we will have, um, there are, are three positions that basically are uh, mandated by the, the NOAA uh, structure, that there's a reserve manager, a research coordinator, and an education coordinator are the first three positions that we will be looking for. And those are uh, expected to be provided by the state as part of the match for the federal uh, funding portion of this. So NEARS is funded at most 70% federal as the total budget, and the state has to provide 30% match to that. Um, and so those positions will be coming up uh, as soon as we can get them through the system and um, get the ads out there and, and there will be open searches for those coming up in late summer, early fall. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have a bunch of good questions now. Uh, what, let's see, regarding coral, what are the conditions of the corals in the site? Do they need restoring? I would say it depends on where we look at. There are different uh, portions of the bay, some of the locations, uh, certainly around Moku Oloi, uh, tends to be in pretty good shape and it has some of the highest coral cover in the state of Hawaii. Uh, other locations, certainly down around the stream mouth of, of Heia Stream, where there's a lot of freshwater input and where presumably sediments when we will start looking at alien species removal of California grass and mangroves, we will expect that there will be a change in the sediment inputs. Um, those things are not going to be uh, expected to be as in good of condition and, and in fact there are some areas there where there's pretty low coral cover already. Uh, and then some of the reefs in between where we see a variety of effects and, and certainly alien invasive algae that has overgrown some of those reefs has been a major um, impact on some of those reefs and so the removal and maintenance of uh, algae free conditions on those reefs means that they end up being a much more uh, coral friendly and uh, uh, typical reef uh, ecosystem than when it is completely overgrown by a mat of eucuma or grassalaria. Okay, uh, thank you. And another science question. What is the expected impact of the removal of the invasive mangrove on the sediment flux to the reef? Well, the, that is certainly what everyone is concerned about. And so the real question is, is it a pulse? And are, 
if you remove the mangroves, are we going to see a, a pulse of sediment that is released? Uh, as it looks right now, the expectation for most people is that the mangroves are holding uh, sediments and preventing sediments from transporting out onto the reef. The initial studies that have been done suggest that that impression is actually false and that the mangroves are a net exporter of sediments and not a net retainer of sediments. And so we may actually see the exact opposite effect that once the mangroves are removed and we go through the initial disturbance phase where people are tromping around in there uh, removing the mangroves, we may actually see a net reduction in sediment delivery and that is something that is, is to be determined and that I think everyone uh, from the state, from the federal side, from the, the managers of this place are looking to see what effect will that have and is it a good idea that should be followed in other places or not. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, let's see, a, a comment and a question. Uh, thank you for a, a wonderful webinar. It's exciting to see the close collaboration with Indigenous groups at the Heia Nier. Will there be opportunities for the Heia Nier to share and overlap with other Niers across the country that are also collaborating with Indigenous groups and engaging in restoration that utilizes traditional ecological knowledge? Oh, from, uh, from Noah's perspective, we uh, we definitely will expect that to happen in the future. There are multiple reserves on the west coast, Alaska, and the southeast, and the Gulf, I mean, at the Gulf, the uh, Great Lakes that uh, work with tribes and local uh, native groups that uh, I think they can all learn from each other. Uh, as we get together in the reserve, and he becomes uh, an integral part of the system, I think you'll see more of that over time. Uh, initially, you know, they're just going to be focused on building their capacities, getting staffed up, et cetera. But over time, yeah, I, I assume and I believe that they will be uh, fully integrated in sharing their knowledge with the other uh, reserves that deal with uh, Native peoples and communities. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, the last question that we have right now, let's see, what is the plan and or broader vision for the partnership between the NEAR and Smithsonian's Marine Geo Program? Well, I am not sure, Rob. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, so um, Marine Geo is an active long-term um, basically biodiversity survey and, and they're interested in large-scale comparisons among many sites uh, both sort of tropical and beyond uh, globally and so there is obvious synergies between the two and that's something that uh, Marine Geo has been interested in what will happen with the near site and has already uh, asked how they may partner with this and um, vice versa. The, the NEARS is very interested, I think, as a system in having the data that are being collected from these long-term monitoring programs be used for larger scale uh, comparative work and, and, and collaborations. And so it seems like it's, it's a no-brainer that those two will partner and uh, try in as best as possible to share data in a way that, that makes sense for everyone to benefit. Okay. Thank you, thank you Rob. All right. And um, we don't have any other questions right now. If you get them in real quick, we might be able to handle them. But um, I'd just like to thank Rob and Matt so much for it. They've given this present twice, presentation twice. And so um, it was, and we had good turnout for both. So we're really appreciative that they gave so much of their time, energy, um, for the presentations, I mean, as well as all the wonderful work that went into the Heia Nier. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone who was able to attend today. We're, we're so glad we were able to offer a second webinar uh, and, and make it possible for, for all of you to attend. Um, and we look forward to having you on future webinars, and uh, hopefully everyone will get to visit the Heia Nier sometime in the near future. Okay, and thanks again, Matt and Rob. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Bye, everyone.